So it was January 2010, and we were losing the war in Afghanistan. We knew this because there were more Taliban in the rural areas of the country than when we started in 2002. And, and we also knew that we needed a new approach. We needed a new strategy. And it involved, at least for special forces, Green Berets, getting back to our roots and getting back out into the villages, working by, with, and through indigenous Pashtun populations and indigenous clans the way we had done as Green Berets for decades. The only problem was we had kind of moved away from that approach of by, with, and through and embedding ourselves in these villages after 9-11 in favor of a more direct action oriented approach. So it was a shift for us. The other challenge that was happening was that these villages that we were going to move into and work with and help these local Afghans stand up on their own against Taliban threats, they were going through a churn of activity. They were going through a churn of uh, just erosion of social currency that was really debilitating. And it was gonna make our work very hard. They, they, had, they had become severely distracted by all of the change that was happening around them. They had also become disengaged, a lack of purpose, uh, just decades of suffering and drought and food insecurity. And most of all, they had become severely distrustful they were already an in-group and out-group society, a status society, but because of all the conflict, 40 years, imagine that, in your neighborhood, nonstop conflict of 40 years where even the children have post-traumatic stress, they had become distrustful. They had lost trust in each other, and they'd sure as hell lost trust in us. So we had to move into these communities and in our best possible way, engage them and cross those gaps, uh, overcome that churn. And a lot of what we did to do that was not elbowing our way into the villages like we had done for 10 years, you know, with our body armor and RoboCop look. I'm from the government, how do you like me so far? But we, we, we got back to our roots and we started using our old school interpersonal skills, our, our what I call the Lorenzian skills, the, the skills that T.E. Lawrence used to connect with the Badu nation in World War I, storytelling, active listening, attunement, physical presence. And I found myself doing a lot of that. Uh, it, it was one of, one of my roles in this village stability program that I wrote my book Game Changers about was about how we engaged these locals at a community level. And a lot of it was storytelling. And these were mostly agrarian societies. They used low tech, 19th century, 18th century, in some cases, technology to farm. And so, you know, I would face these situations. How in the world am I going to make a connection with these elders who have all of this distrust, disengagement, and distraction, and we're so different? And what I found was I would always tell a story that was usually around tobacco farming. I would talk about my family farming tobacco and the mountains of Western North Carolina and all of the hardships that went with it, the struggles. Uh, I would tell stories about my brother and me hanging tobacco up in the barn because we were the youngest, so we were the highest and falling down through the rafters and the times when the yield would be so low and we were wondering how we were gonna make ends meet. And, and the, the interesting thing was that those elders, although they had never farmed tobacco in their life, they were right into that story with me. They were always leaning in and nodding very quickly because they understood struggle, they understood uh, farming it, it, from a subsistence level, and there was an immediate connection. We didn't talk about the Taliban, we didn't talk about democracy, we simply talked about something that we could both connect to and it was around a story. I would tell that story and then they would share stories about their farming experiences. And over time, we started to bridge those gaps and build a connection. Now, I will tell you, while that was a very sporty situation, there's nothing unique about that churn that we faced there that you're not facing now. If you're watching this podcast, and I want to welcome you to our Rooftop Leadership Podcast, you're facing a lot of that churn right now. You are facing that triple D churn. There is, there is absolutely... 
distraction in your life right now as you think about it. Right? There's distraction, and a lot of it's coming from just the modern world we live in. It's very transactional. Uh, there are the, the devices that we're all on these days. And of course, there's all the uncertainty that's happening in our world today, right? There's just a lot of uncertainty and that causes distraction. There's a lot of disengagement, right? According to my, uh, Gallup, 85% of the population in the workforce today is disengaged, right? And this work from home is really adding to that. It's causing us to lose our sense of purpose. And I see this every day when I engage people and we've got to be mindful of that. And then finally, you know, just like we dealt with distrust in those villages, there's also distrust in the world you live in right now, right? Um, according to my, uh, Gallup, two thirds of Americans no longer trust their neighbor. And according to Robert Putnam, uh, in his book, Bowling Alone, this really started back in 1972, just this ongoing erosion of trust. But if you look at some of the things that are happening with social injustice today and other things, they're, they're, it's, it's compounding it. So these are just realities in our life. It's our baseline that we have to deal with, and it's things that we're up against, and some are more pronounced in, in areas than others. But as you think about this tonight, I want you to think about how is this churn of these three Ds affecting how you engage your clients, how you engage your employees, even your neighbors and your kids, right? It's, it, it, it's a factor. And, and so the question then becomes, you know, the, well, the last thing I'll say that I think there's an effect here is I believe the way this shows up in our life is just like in Afghanistan, it creates groups and it creates gaps that we have to deal with as leaders. Right, and they, it's just a natural manifestation of this erosion of social currency that we're dealing with as leaders. These groups and these gaps, and you know, my assessment, watching the news for the three seconds that I can take it, is no one else <laughs> is coming right now. I think from a leadership perspective, it's yep. up to us as rooftop leaders, as community leaders, to find a way to bridge these groups and gaps. And how do we do that? How do we bridge in this in this time of of kind of low social currency. And, I, and story, the same way that, that I use the tobacco story to, to bridge, story can serve us as leaders in a very, very powerful way. And there's no one better to help us think through that, to navigate that than Dr. Kendall Haven. And uh, I, I am so excited that he's with us tonight uh, on our rooftop podcast of High Stakes Storytelling. That's the title of tonight's episode. And it, we're really asking ourselves, how can we bridge trust gaps through stories? That's what we're going to talk about in, in this podcast so that you have these kinds of answers to understand why story is important in this modern time and what you can do about it. And I just want to, I want to, I want to share Dr. Uh, Haven's bio with you. He's a very, very modest person, but uh, this, uh, you know, you're going to see real quickly why from, from my work at, that I do in narrative competence and, and helping leaders tell stories in high stakes situations, this guy right here is the, is, is the guy that, that, that's the pillar that I draw from. So he's an internationally recognized subject matter expert on the cognitive and neuroscience of story, a field that he helped create. Um, Kendall is a performing master storyteller and the only West Point grad to turn professional storyteller. I love that. Um, for over 35 years, he led the research for the National Storytelling Association and the International Storytelling Center into effective story structure and into the process of story-based influence and persuasion. That's where we're going to go tonight on, on how you can be thinking about the use of story in these low-trust times. Um, he's been designated as a distinguished visiting scholar at Stanford. He has consulted extensively with the DOD and has been selected as a topical expert by the State Department. Um, his two seminal works are Story Proof and Story Smart. They've, they've revolutioned our, revolutionized our understanding of the neural and science aspects of the story elements that control influence, empathy, emotion, and persuasion. He serves as a story consultant to departments in various governmental agencies and to the Singapore Armed Forces, as, with, as well as numerous corporations, nonprofits, and educational organizations. 
and he's probably going to hang me up for reading that. But I just, um, I'm, I'm, I want you to know who you're dealing with tonight. I want you to know who you're going to be getting these insights from. My, as I was telling him earlier, both of these books are so scuffed up from carrying them around and, and, and doing the work that I do. And I know you'll feel the same way. Um, the reason that I brought him on though, is that um, I think he's a game changer in storytelling. And one of the, his monikers that he uses, and I think this will resonate with all of you, is he brings the science to the art of storytelling. And what that means to us as rooftop leaders is it lets us take our instincts and turn them into skill. And that's what we need right now is we need skilled leaders who can employ story to bridge this triple D churn, these gaps. So with that very long introduction and story, wow. uh, Kendall, it's really great to have you on, sir. It's great to be here. And I love that. Uh, you're absolutely right. We all do have real strong instinct for story. And for some odd reason, uh, we, in, in our culture, in most of the developed cultures in, on this planet, somehow we disconnect those instincts from learning so that they wind up being held in the subconscious mind they're automatic, but they're not things we have conscious control over. And really, for me, working with people on story uh, isn't about teaching anybody anything new. It's about making you consciously aware of what, at a subconscious, automatic level, you've been practicing and developing since you were two years old. Mm. Uh, yeah. so I, I, I love the way you just said that, that, that was, that's a classic. I just wrote it down. So I, <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. And you're absolutely right. It, you know, when it comes to, I believe effective storytelling, it's, it's, it's less about what you put on and more about what you take off, um, yeah. as you, as you tap into that. It's so good. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm chomping at the bit Kindle to get into the, the content, sure. but the first thing is I love your story. <laughs> I, I really do. I love how you, um, how you came into uh, storytelling. And if you see me mm. looking down as you're watching this, uh, I'm, I'm going off my iPad right now on, I just want to make sure I don't miss anything. But I'd like to start with, would you, would you mind um, sharing with the folks uh, that, are, that are watching and listening a little bit about how you came to be a master storyteller? And, 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 and then as you wrap it, maybe like, what are your, how your journey, what does that, what could that mean to us as aspiring students of story? Maybe some things hmm. you've learned along the way uh, on your journey from where you were to where you are on this, uh, right. this thing called story. Interesting. All right. Um, well, West Point graduated in 68. Uh, and so five years then uh, in the army during Vietnam War, and in 1972, the word was out that the army would be real thrilled if everybody who could left because <laughs> budgets were slashed, the war was over, and it was time. It was it was time to slash the the roll call, uh, and so I, I got out and went back to graduate school. Got a doc, got my doctorate in oceanography, and was doing research work at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, one of the national research labs, mostly for Department of Energy. And along that time, I also met the woman who became, is now my wife, has been for 30, well, we've been officially married for 36 years together for a little over 40. And so as we, when I met her, um, I was looking for ways to get woo points like you do when you're dating. And she has a sister who had a son, four years old, a single mom. And so to get woo points, because they the sister lived pretty close to the lab, I, I would swing by when I had a chance, pick up the kid and take him to the park to give her a break. And we'd romp and run and play. And if I wanted him to, to, to quiet down for a little bit, uh, I found first that 
he was not interested in quieting down at all. He was he was a runner until he'd go kind of over that emotional cliff, the sort of I don't I don't know if it's emotional or if it's chemical cliff that kids will go over and all of a sudden they flip from everything being right to everything being wrong, nothing being right in the world. He turned into a screaming man banshee that I didn't want to have anything to do with. And in order to prevent that, I found the only way I could slow him down was to say, let's flop into the sandbox, I'll make up a story. So he plopped in the sandbox there at the park, I'd make up a story. And I started to notice that every time I'd make up, I was making these up off the top of my head. Every time I'd start a story, this is 82, it's pre-cell phone time, uh, people would start to gather around and listen. And I started watching the adults passing by, some of them three-piece business suits, power ties, carrying briefcases, obviously going important places. And you could see them lean in toward the story and slow down in their pacing as if I was a gravity well. And literally they were being drawn into a, to a black hole. Uh, and I, one day in watching these adults who came, who would stop to listen with no guarantee the story was going anywhere. And even if it was going somewhere, they wouldn't know it because they came in in the middle so they missed the beginning, they had no idea where it was going. But yet they stayed and listened intently. It suddenly hit me that people listen to stories differently than they listen to other, the same information delivered through other forms, other media. We, the, the people in the Department of Energy would pay us every year because uh, you know, we had a salary, we'd have budgets that we'd work out with them. So they were paying us to do studies and do reports. And we could never get the people who ordered us to do the studies to read our reports. They, we, we would literally have to build in three or four days effort at the end of a, of a study right. to go for someone to fly back to Washington and walk up and down the halls of the Department of Energy carrying copies of the reports, begging people to even look at it. Yeah. And what I found was, in hindsight, this, I didn't think of it at the time, but in hindsight, this always struck me, you know what I would hear back from them more often than not? I'd say, you know, here's the report, here's the summary, here's the executive summary on top of that. At least read the executive summary, which is a summary of the summary. They'd say, tell me what it says. They'd say, tell me what it says. They were looking for a story. Although at the time I, I had no idea that's what they were looking for. So anyway, in the park, I came to the realization that people listen to story, whatever that meant, that word story, they listened to it differently. So when I dropped out uh, of science in awe of story to, to, to pursue that word, whatever it meant, become a full-time storyteller, one of my goals was to figure out why is it that people do that? What does that mean? Now, I, having spent three and a half decades leading the research effort for it, I can explain it in detail. Um, and it has to do with the way the human brain is wired. So uh, the pathway though, once I just said, now I'm, a, now I'm a storyteller, besides trying to figure out how in the world you then pay rent, uh, was because I wrote my own stories was always to watch audiences and say, why did they like this story? Or why didn't they like this story? What did I, was it something I said, something I did? How, it, it, the, what I've realized is that consciously we don't have at that, at that time in the eighties, really didn't have any vehicles, any training available to say, this is how you really connect with an audience. You, it was a trial and error thing. You, 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 you learn try by fire, test of fire. Either it worked or it didn't work. And if it didn't work, you find another, another job to do. And so it was a very slow effort of building up the experience of what worked and what didn't work and talking other tellers into doing little experiments for me to see what how does how do audiences respond? Where do where are they looking for in a story to get to the point where we were really ready to do serious research um, to unlock the human mind? And then when we can do the research, 
this is the, I, an incredible flip that we can um, that has has made possible the research and research results that I've done and that other people have done. Always, we've looked at story and said, "Okay, I heard someone tell a story, and the story was good, and it worked." We look at the story. We look at the material. We look at the telling of it. We say, "Oh, I'm going to tell like he tells, because he told the story and it worked." I'm going to tell stories like he like his stories because that that worked without really knowing what about it worked. We don't have a clue as to what about a story or a telling actually registered with and influenced an audience member. Right. We've right. been able to flip it. So now we're not looking at the stories, we're looking at human brains. Yeah, and that's that's what I want to jump in there because that's one of the things um, for folks, if you're thinking about like, if you deal with what I love about story proof, Kendall, if it's okay, if I jump in is that in the very beginning, you, these bullet comments that you have that address elements mm. of why story works, um, you know, it, it's so compelling and it just hits you right in the face. And so if to any leader out there, if, if you are making a move, to bring story into how you market, how you communicate to your people, and you have people in the way that this, I mean, this just blows out of the water, the resistance that is there. And, and, and Tyndall, you've done a ton of action. I mean, like there's hard data and research oh, yeah. that you brought forward, right? It's all Why hard, it it's, it's all, it's all back, everything in either of those books is backed by uh, a, a very significant mountain of hard research that has been peer reviewed, tested and, and validated on live audiences as well as in the labs. Um, let me break in and just sort of take a little flip before I introduce a couple of it. What, what being able to look at, not the story, but the, the mind of the receiver to say what happens. So we're looking at their brains on story and saying, okay, what, what, what really registers? Uh, a quick example. This is actually, and this is not one that, I don't think I put this in any of the books. It, it happened in September of 2002. Literally September 26th of 2002, two days after my 55th birthday. And I can't tell you why, but when that birthday hit on the 24th of September, 2002, for the first time ever, it just sort of, landed on me that I was approaching what people call getting old and I wasn't ready for it at all. And I had no interest in it. And I was, and, and, and that's when I, for the first time ever, I really considered and rejected and fought against the, the whole notion of getting old. Two days later, I'm in the town of Mariposa, California, little gold rush town. I was going to go to the high school, spend the day there. I had to be there at seven 40. I'm a breakfast person. So I got up from the little motel where I was staying and left at 6.15, which meant that I dumped, take my, took my key and dumped it through a slot in the office door because no one was going to come into the office till 8. So I was out of my room and then realized that there are only two restaurants in town that serve breakfast and neither one opens till 7. The only place that was open was Burger King. So I took my newspaper, went into the Burger King, up to the counter, said uh, coffee, small coffee, black. Girl at the counter, if you had told me she was 13, I would have believed it. But I suspect she probably was older than that. She smiled back, big customer service smile, pointed at a sign over on the wall next to her and said, senior citizen discount. I looked over at the sign and it said coffee was $1. five, but for senior citizens, small coffee was 25 cents for their valued senior citizen customers, 65 and over. I looked at her and I said, gee, that's a great deal, but I gotta tell you, I'm nowhere near 65. She looked back at me with a big customer service smile and said, oh, that's okay. You look way plenty old enough to me. That was the event 
Now, I want you to look at the two stories that walked away from there. I, I actually found out about hers. She used that incident when at the, that, later that month, she applied for employee of the month and used that as an example of her excellent customer service. That was her version of the story. My version was, I was pissed. I flopped down my quarter, took my coffee. I was, I had just been mortally insulted. Wow. I boycotted Burger King for a decade. Now the question is, which of those two stories matters? Wow. If you're talking about cut stories for, for, an, for an organization, the only story that matters is mine. Mm. And yet the company, company representative thought she did an incredibly good job, wow. told a wonderful story about what a wonderful company Burger King is. And that's what happens with stories. It is, the more we research it, the more we find it is common for target audiences to completely flip a story and hear a story that is radically different from the story that someone, a leader, thought they told. Wow. So, man. Go ahead. Jump in. Yeah, That's I want to point. jump in here because um, so with that, with that, with you teeing that up, then I, I'm wondering if we could, could we pivot that into help you helping us understand yes. how the brain works? How does the brain work, Kendall, around story? Why is story so compelling of a tool, yep. a communication tool? And that's the place to go. So Here's what we're, and let me do a couple of headline and, and yeah. headline sentences and, and then get into the process a little bit. Here's what we were able to establish mostly in EEG, some in fMRI labs, doing extensive modeling and monitoring of people's brains while, while they were listening to story-based material. First, the human brain and this is true for every culture on the planet, the human brain is hardwired so that it, at a subconscious level, makes sense of incoming information or experience and creates meaning of incoming information or experience in very specific and explicit story terms. It's not that you can do it, it's that you automatically do it at a subconscious level. Second, when you do it, it's before that information ever reaches the conscious mind. Wow. So it's not that the information that comes into your sensory organs gets to your conscious mind and then you muddle it into story. It's that it happens before that. So the question is, isn't, did I, did I say what I wanted to say? Did I tell the information I wanted to tell? That's, that's not the question to ask at all. The, the irrelevant question is, did my target audience hear the information and the story I need for them to hear? That's a radically different question, which throws a whole different perspective point on developing your material. You're now developing it based on the target audience, not based on what you want to say or create. So here's what happens. Let's say you read something information goes into your eyes, to the optic nerve. What goes down the optic nerve is not letters and words. It's a dot pattern. It's like the old uh, radar, uh, uh, um, cathode ray tube guns that would shoot at a, at a screen back in those days when we had cathode ray tubes. Right. There'd be a gun that would shoot electrons at, 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 at a screen. And though the, what it would shoot at the screen was just information that would say, light up or don't light up. Um, and once we got color in, then it would have a little more information that would cue those different color layers. But it's, and then that one dot would light up. And then the gun goes to the next dot and does the same thing. But it does it all really fast. So from the other side of the screen, it looks like a picture. It's that same kind of information that's going down the optic nerve. It's a dot pattern. It gets to some processing centers in the lower back part of the brain 
um, back just above the, the brain stem. And th they re then reassemble that dot pattern into lines, uh, in into shapes. So, and then that goes to parts, to other subregions in the brain that say, I recognize that that's called a letter or that's called a number. Uh, and then those get put together in a different subregion back there says, oh, wait a minute, I recognize that that's called a word goes to a dictionary and says, I know what that word is. It, consciously, you're not aware of any of that. Yeah. At the same time, there are other centers that, we're, we, that we could identify and isolate that, I'm not, that I named the neural story net because we needed to call it something, uh, that look at that and say, how does this, net, this series of words and, and uh, letters, words that, that are stringing together as, as the information is coming down the optic nerve, what do they mean to me? How do I make, how do I make sense out of them? And that happens before the information ever first gets to the to the conscious mind. So that, for example, eight people can can see a, a big accident in the middle of an intersection, and when the cops go around and interview those eight eyewitnesses, they get eight completely different stories. Right. So to to to, to capitalize on that, then what you're saying is that, and I think you say it like this in in story proof is sto we make sense of the world yep. through through story. And, 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 and it actually, that story actually happens before the cognitive process. Is and let's right? not say story, let's say specific story elements. Got it. Because we were able to isolate those elements. When you say story, a lot of people think, oh yeah, you tell your story. Well, no, it's very specific bits, pieces of information that the neural story net uses to create, to build those stories. If the neural story net gets that information from the source material, Generally speaking, it accepts it. When there are gaps in the in those specific bits of information that the neural story net is looking for, okay, that person creates those, fills in that gap on its own. It infers, it implies, uses its own. Each person uses their own experience, their own banks of prior knowledge to say, "This is what fit, should fit into that gap. This is how I should interpret." that bit of information because some, some other information is missing. And so for example, Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to, I was going to say, um, does this, and we're going to come around to this in a minute, but does this get to the, uh, the eight essential components of a story? Yes. Eight elements. Yep. Uh, but first let me just a, a, a quick demo of that concept. If you are standing in a corner, I don't care, picture it a, a party, a, a, a meeting, somewhere you're kind of in this corner and you hear this conversation. Person number one says, hi, John. Person number two says, Shh, I'm not here. You never saw me. I'm not here. Person number one says, oh, that's okay. Carol's gone home. If you heard that conversation, you would know exactly how to make sense out of it, how to understand it, right? You'd probably say, Oh, person number two is John. And what John is saying is, keep it quiet. There are certain people I don't want to run into today. So I, you know, I, I want to stay in the background. And person number one who understands the situation says, okay, Carol's gone home. You don't have to hide, you, you wimp, right? That's not what it says. If you take the statements I gave you literally, the only conclusion you can come to is poor person number two, whoever that is, has lost all touch with reality because one, they are here. And you, person number one, not only have seen them, you're looking at them right now. But I have never run into anyone who stopped and pondered what accepting that those statements as factual statements could mean and how to build them into the story. Instantly, what everyone does it's completely reverse. Every factual statement person number two provides. Why? Because it makes it make sense. Wow. The brain does that all the time. Right. Now that's a fun little example, but it, we do it all, we do it with, with core content information just as readily. And yeah. 
to make it more dangerous, what reaches your conscious mind is that make sense version. And you think that is exactly what you heard. So we get to the two questions that are the heart of, uh, of, of controlling communication which is really where we we're, we're, we're wanna talk about is controlling, how do you control communication and, and effectively communicate with other people in, in difficult times? Two questions. First, how does the human brain make sense out of incoming information? And, and we're able to show that's controlled by these eight specific story-based informational elements. Yep. They're the ones that the neural story net uses to make sense of things. Having made sense, the question is, question number two, how does the brain then create meaning from that? Meaning is where we start to have some effect on people, some influence. And some people, for some reason, have, a, have taken a real dark view of influence. Let me define influence uh, and the, 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 the actual classical definition. Influence is change, changing someone's attitudes, beliefs, values and or knowledge in order to affect and change their behavior. Yep. That's influence. Every time you communicate, that's what you're trying to do. And, and, and when you think about these day and times that we're in right now, that, that, that I just described, this erosion of social currency, sure. where we're, we're moving away from each other, I'd say we could use some positive influences like that. Uh, we, well, I would say there, I've never heard of a time when we didn't. But certainly, it, 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 it's desperately needed now. Yeah. Um, and so th those eight elements, and, 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 I, and I realize we're, you know, we're not doing, a, uh, we're not putting them up on the board and doing diagrams of them. Hey, Kendall. But let me, I can list them real quickly. Go ahead. Yeah, I did, I, before you hit the eight elements, I wanted to, because I want to just do a complete pivot into the, the, the influence and engagement. But yeah. I, would it be okay before you do that? I just want to leave it on uh, a quote that you have that I was I, oh. I want to share with them. That's sure. it's something that I, I read a lot when I'm when I'm training, um, and I and it's actually a two part quote from from Story Proof, but I think it it, it encapsulates. I just want to leave this with the listeners as we pivot mm -hmm. into okay, how do you do it? But if you're if you're wondering, you know, why story is so important. As this is from this is from Story Smart on page 24. It says the brain converts raw experience into story form and then considers, ponders, remembers, and acts on the self-created story, not the actual input experience, not the raw data, not the PowerPoint right. slides. Uh, and then I usually pivot into this next page that you have on page 30. And I say, you know, Kendall goes on to say unless you shape your material into that specific story structure, then it will pass through the conscious mind with few, if yep. any, internal alterations, additions, and restructurings. Yep. Your story reaches the conscious mind, not some other story created by the receiver's own mind. And I just think that's such a powerful thing to really make the case for why story is such a critical vehicle for influence. And, and I kind of wanted to just put that out there to allow you to pivot now into, okay, yeah. now let's talk about influence, engagement, and what those eight elements are. Okay, so uh, you're absolutely right. The brain of every, uh, every person that you, with whom you communicate is gonna use these eight elements to build a story. If they get this information from you, they they'll use them uh if they don't they'll as you as you just read they'll they will quite happily that neural story net will fill in on its own and it does it at a subconscious level so that the conscious mind isn't even aware that it's happening so stories are all about characters specifically a few select character positions we all know about a main character i've heard of main character we've heard of the antagonist uh, there's one other that I'll, I'll, I'll get to in a minute, these character positions. Second is what we'd call character traits. Just, it's information 
that lets the audience be able to hang on to a character and make that character be of interest one way or another to the audience, to the target audience. So they're willing to hold on to it. Third one, we get to a big one, goal. I'm going to write as you go. I'm going to write them on the board. Okay. So one character and write character positions. Two is traits. Well, yeah. Uh, is that three, right or just traits? That's good. That's, that's fine. Because they are traits of the characters. So, okay. and, they, and again, the, the traits are just some information that differentiates this character from all the other characters in the world. Right. Uh, and, and so that we can, we can, that character can become just of a sufficient interest to the audience that they'll hold on to that one. Third, goal. A goal is what a character needs or wants to do or get in a story. It needs to be something that is tangible and visualizable. Peace on earth is a terrible goal. Why? We don't know what it looks like. So we can't really visualize it. We don't know if, if the story is getting there or not getting there. Happiness is a terrible goal. Um, safety is a terrible goal. Those we'll get to in a moment. They have a place, but a goal needs to be something real and tangible. Fourth, motive. This, as we research it, has become more and more powerful and more and more important. It's, it tends to be grossly underemphasized in most schools and most trainings. Motive technically is the information that makes a goal important to the character and relevant to the audience. Can you say that again? Yep, motive is that information that makes a goal important to the character and relevant to the audience. I, I hope people heard what you just said, because like that is gold. I mean, it really is. When we think about how we communicate uh, a story like that, that has to be developed beforehand, doesn't it? It, yeah, you have to, but, Motive, it winds up being a, a far more important tool. We'll go back to it over and over again as, as before this hour is over. Um, so this is where values, beliefs, attitudes, gripes, issues, concerns, all of those forces that we would call drivers, that drive behavior, this is where they belong. And here's what we were able to show in the lab. We would call it motive matching. If a, a target audience perceives that the motives driving a character match their own, always they will start to empathize with and identify with that character. I can take a 10 minute story and flip one sentence in that story that reveals motive information and have an audience member at my whim either start to identify with, root for a char character or turn on the character. Motive winds up being one of the most powerful tools available for controlling how your target audience relates to the characters you put in your story. And this isn't always used in a good way, is it, Kendall? I mean, we see motive matching used by fundamentalists and, and others. Yeah, oh, it, people. All of these, all of these elements uh, have no value component to them. Um, they are the tools that control how a human brain receives the information. Yep. Now it's up to each teller to have the moral fortitude and the moral ethics to use them yep. properly to use Thank them for, uh, for the benefit of humanity and, and not for some self-serving purpose as yeah. way too often gets done on this planet. Well said, sir. All right, five, conflicts and problems. 
these are the obstacles that block a character from reaching a goal. What's interesting is they're only relevant to an audience member if the audience can see that that particular obstacle actually does block a character from reaching a goal. If I said, for example, oh, it's an example, um, George wanted to go next door to visit his girlfriend, but his car was out of gas. Now, car out of gas, that's a problem, right? It's not a conflict, it's a problem. But, but in that story, do you care? Because his goal is to go next door to visit his girlfriend. And you have two choices. One is you say, well, who cares? I don't care about his car. He's going to walk anyway. Or else you say, oh, he lives way out in the country and next door is five miles down the road. So he needs to have the car. Um, obstacles, conflicts and problems. A conflict is a kind of problem that puts our character in opposition to some other entity in the story to make right. a conflict, those only have relevance as we can see that they block characters from reaching goals. One tendency of a lot of companies and government agencies and, and actually nonprofit organizations is to pretend like there are no problems in conflicts. It's almost like saying, if I have a problem or a conflict, that's a weakness. And then of course, the counter, what happens is you remove all of the all of the value of the story all of the uh, all of the interest that you might have accumulated in the story because it now sounds like you're just bragging you say this is what i wanted and uh, and, and if there are no problems if there's nothing for you to struggle against then what's the, there is no point to the story Go ahead. But is, isn't this what leaders are, are doing today, Kendall? I mean, in your experience working yeah. in corporate America, and I don't wow. want to generalize, but I find that a lot of leaders, they want to, you know, they want to, they want to show the success story. Everything's fine here. Everything. You know, it's and, the and, John and Wayne. No yep. 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 So let me, let me go on because I want to come back to that point here of one more, the sixth sure. of those elements. And this is another one that doesn't get enough recognition risk and danger risk is the likelihood of failure the probability it's a mathematical probability that something's going to go wrong danger is the consequences of failure it's what happens to a character when something goes wrong say that can you say that one more okay. time risk is the probability of failure the likelihood that something's going to go wrong Danger is the consequences of failure. It's what happens to you when something goes wrong. Uh, the product, those two, risk and danger, create are the primary elements that create excitement in a story. They create tension. And the old saying goes, as goes tension, so goes attention. Tension is created by risk and danger. They come from the problems and conflicts that block a character from reaching a goal. It is amazing to me how many organizations and companies don't want to talk about risk and danger. They want to make it look like everything is fine. We have no problems. We have, there's nothing can go wrong. And the story not only is boring, what happens is the audience then turns on you. The greater the danger, the greater the risk that a character or a company is willing to face in order to achieve a noble goal, the greater we empathize with, support, and root for that character. And also, one more add-in that we can, now, uh, we can now substantiate from lab work, the more that that audience will adopt the viewpoint and the values of the, 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 the character or the company. Uh, In other words, can, if, let me repeat no, that one ahead. and then you can go on. Yeah. If you want, if you're a company and you want a target audience to adopt a certain attitude, a certain viewpoint, the greater the risk and the danger that the company or the representative character in the story face 
in order to achieve a noble goal, the more likely it is that your target audience, even though they'll do it subconsciously, will adopt, not, not only empathize with, not only identify with, but will, will mentally adopt the attitudes and beliefs that you want them to adopt. It goes up, it's all driven by risk and danger. Yeah. Go ahead. It's, 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 no, I just wanted to, I wanted to, as, as, a, as a fellow soldier, I also want to want to tell you uh, what an impact your work has had in the the veteran space, especially mm. uh, our men and women that are coming home from combat, and we're dealing with trauma. We're dealing with and Monty, who's just off camera here, my wife and I, we founded a nonprofit called the Hero's Journey. We put a play together that we wrote, and I'm performing with other veterans called uh, Last Out: Elegy of a Green Beret. But what, mm -hmm. I'm, what I'm getting to here is uh, I do a TED Talk in Santa Barbara. I'm going to send it to you. I'd, I'd love oh, it good. if you'd be willing to watch it. That'd but be it's, great. Called, it's called The Generosity of Scars. And, and the whole purpose of it oh, is really good. speaks to what you're saying here is that, there, that to me as a leader, for those of us who've been scuffed up and we've been through things in our life, if we are willing to be generous with our scars, in other words, repurpose our struggle in the yep. service of others, uh, it creates a level of reciprocity, relatability, and connection that's just unmatched. And I think that's really good news for our veterans, for our first responder, people who've been through trauma. Like, that's who we need leading us. And, and, and when they lead, as you just, you just said, it is, it is that struggle and, and the risk and danger that they had to overcome that gives credibility to the story. So great. So, so great. You want to hit seven? Number seven, we're now down to the first time we'll mention anything about plot or at, at the element in the story. And uh, seven is struggle. If you want to have a three word definition of story, characters at war. Wow. Wow. Said a little differently, it's a character struggling to overcome problems and conflicts while facing substantial risk and danger to achieve a goal that is important to them and, relative to, and relevant to the audience, characters at war. That's, Man, that that's so a story. Good. That's that so the essence good. of a story. But, you know, if, if um, the Lone Ranger stomps out of his hotel room because they say, the bank's being robbed, the bank's being robbed, and he goes across the street and there's old 85 year old blind, sweatly, sweatly happiness. And old sweatly is stumbling out of the bank saying, ha, I got a penny off the floor. I picked up a penny off the floor. I robbed the bank, ha ha ha. If, if then the Lone, Ra or the Lone Ranger snatches up sweatly, whacks him upside the head, drags him off and throws him in the jail, no one's happy with the Lone Ranger. Why? there was no risk and danger to him. And so what we do is turn on the character. The char there was no struggle. If mm. you ignore the struggle and the, and, and the risk and the danger, you negate the ability of the potential that the audience will empathize with the story. So we omit struggle as we story tend to all the time. We, well, we, we, not as storytellers, but as yeah. organizations and as, as leaders, leaders, we tend to as do leaders. it. And it's a, it, it is just exactly dead, dead on backwards to what we ought to do. Yeah, and we, but we, if we omit story or struggle, we do so at our peril. Yeah, what'll happen is most likely is that you'll just lose the, you will, you'll lose engagement. The audience will stop being engaged, they'll stop listening. Okay, all right. Number eight, details. We get information about the world through, through our senses, our five senses, have for all your life, right? So your brain knows exactly what to do with sensory information when it comes into the brain. What something looks like, sounds like, smells like, feels like, tastes like, we know your brain knows what to do with that. And really what it does is then recreate vivid mental imagery that it files away into memory. We're very good at remembering pictures. We're lousy at remembering words. 
So what happened, the reason details are all of the, the bits of century, century based information on what things in this story look like, sound like, smell like, feel like, that you put in the reason it's number eight is not because it's less important, but first you want to lay out the story, which is those first seven elements, characters, struggling to overcome problems and conflicts, facing risk and danger to get to a goal that's important to them. And that you lay that out and then say, what pictures do I need my audience to hold in their minds mm. when they see that? And you can't do, do in, you can't do a, a plethora of rich, vivid details for everything in a story it bogs down the pace too much. So you say, what pictures is it important for my audience to hold in their minds? Look for where those moments occur in the story and that's where you really pile in those sensory details. Wow. And that then creates the mental imagery that becomes the basis in, uh, the, th those images become the basis in memory for how we do memory and recall, and then recall so, the story along with it. Those are the eight. Yeah, that's wonderful, Kendall. And just as an example, one of my uh, one of the folks I work with, he's a he's a pretty senior leader in a in a big bank, and he tells a story at his all hands about uh, losing his sister mm. uh, to uh, she she had addictions and 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 just a range of problems. But but he talks about walking into the hospital in the town where it occurred and what it smelled like when he walked in there and, and, and what it felt like. Yeah. And you literally feel like you're, you're there. in the hospital with him. Yep. And, and, and what's happening there when that, when that occurs? What actually, because uh, what, what you file into memory are, are sensory images. That's what we tend to file into memory. Here's what the research says. The greater the density of sensory imagery for any specific potential memory, the greater the density of those sensory details, the greater the probability you will accurately be able to recall that out of memory and that when you do recall it, you'll be able to accurately reproduce it in, in your conscious mind. Um, the lower the density of sensory details, the lower the probability you'll remember it at all and the greater the probability that when you do, you'll distort it a lot in bringing it into back into your, your uh, conscious mind. So you pick those moments, those bits where that you really want your audience to hold on to and remember forever. And that's where yeah. the that's where the sensory information really needs to go. Wow. So as we look at these eight elements, Kendall, and, 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 uh, you know, you've got you've got a leader out there who who is maybe going to tell a story to their client um, about about the maybe the 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 role that they're playing uh, in this crisis that we're in or an experience mm -hmm. that they had, and they want to connect with their client. They want the story to do that. They want the client to get a sense of them and what they're about. Uh, how would you advise that client to to think Good. about these eight steps mm -hmm. and and come at it first? Story is not the message. Story is the vehicle that carries your message. It is the most powerful, effective, and accurate vehicle available to you to deliver your messaging into the conscious mind of another person. So you think first, what, who is my target audience? Every effective story is target audience specific. What are their issues? What, what's important to them? What's relevant to them right now? Second, what is my message? In one sentence, preferably it's a bumper sticker. What is it that you, what's the message? What's the takeaway that you want them to all get? And then you start to look at how do I construct my story so that they'll get that takeaway message uh, and so that my, that target audience will be engaged by the story and will relate to the characters. So you say, well, what are my options on who I tell the story about? I can do it about myself. I can do it about my company. I can do it about maybe a client. I could, I could do it about a customer that we service. I could do it 
what uh, yep. you'll have eight or nine different options for, for character and you say all right for each of those what are the motives that drive them and 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 how do those will those match with the motives that i know drive my target audience so then you pick a you pick the character and you say all right for this story a story ends when the main character resolves one way or the other their primary goal yep that's where a story ends so you say well at the end that's where i want to deliver my takeaway message so let's think about what how do i word the goal so that we'll be able to resolve it at the end of the story and 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 whatever is my takeaway message whatever is the point i want to make will be critical to the way the story resolves itself to the way that the goal of the main character is resolved then you say all right now let's look at what are the problems and conflicts that i want to use that could block character during the story from reaching goal and which ones of those will resonate most with my with my target audience which ones will they say ah oh, yeah that happens to me all the time yeah i'm with you there all right and then how do i play up the risk and the danger that my character has to face uh and at that point you've really defined a story and you define a story that has a specific purpose because you started with the messaging you want to get across and the people you wanted to get across to and that ultimately is your metric always will this story deliver my message to that audience yes or no so as you're developing the story that's the metric the yardstick you use to evaluate the story is can i use this story i think this story the way i'm developing it will hold the attention of my target audience and deliver this message my my core message to them wow and so kendall you know, I, I, I want to reemphasize too, we're coming up on the hour. I, I swear to you, I could do this like a lot longer than what we're going for. It's, it's, it is the work you have put in is, is just so over the top good. And, and for anyone out there, if you, you know, you need to pick up both. My, I'm giving you my thoughts as, as the reader and the person who's really tried to apply the hard work that Kendall has put in. I think story proof is an essential read in the beginning, my personal opinion, because uh, I, I think it just gives such great insights into why story is so valued and, and useful as the tool. And then, man, he pivots right in with this and everything he just talked about is in here. I mean, it, it really is. It, it is so well thought out. Uh, one thing I wanted to see if I could frame this, Kendall, because I, I, I think it hit home for me as you were doing it. but. You know, we started today with you talking about how the brain makes sense of the world and it looks for these eight things. And, and, you, right. and you've, you've figured this out along with some other pioneers through the research and, and, and the studies. And, yep. and then, so when these eight things, so the brain, the listener is looking for these things and the th when they're not present or provided, then it fills in the gaps. Fills in the so, gaps with so, what it thinks is the most reasonable, uh, the most appropriate bit of information yeah. to fill in that gap, and, and which may or may not be having a relationship to what the, yeah. act, what the actual teller intended. Right, and, that, and so they're using pattern matching to do that, I guess, from their own experience. From their own experience, yeah. yeah. And they're at it, and they also, no, no story is told, especially in a, corporate environment, leadership environment is told in a vacuum. So the target audience has some expectations going in of the, of the source of what they're going to hear. They're going to have some expectations based on their past association with the person who's providing the information. And so that will color what they use to fill in uh, those missing bits as, as, they, as they come up. Yeah, and so if you think about this, you guys, if you think that the miles that Kendall has run on this is that we've identified, so he's identified, you know, the eight critical elements. You know, one, we know that story is the most effective tool to move people. So, so now you have the eight critical elements that need to be in place and an approach to think about those. And to the degree that you hit those, 
you know, you get back to Kendall's quote that your story passes through all those obstacles and, 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 and the message is received instead of the, the, the listener's own narrative, own story that's developed to fill in those gaps. And Kendall, one of the thing you did that you, st- I think it was in story proof that you talked about, I'm not certain, but you said there's two things that happen when you don't use story. And I found this fascinating was that, and I'll paraphrase and tell me if I get this right, but is one, the, the listener will oftentimes get it wrong or flip it like you yep. talked about. And two, there is a, the, the, to the fact that they have to do all this work and fill this in, it doesn't really help you with the emotional connection to them as well. As you no. said, they can turn on you. They, um, well, they can turn, they'll turn on you. I, I mean, a classic example, um, let me pull one, if, if I got, got them on, I'll pull it, but a, yeah, a good example, a corporate one, uh, Aramco, you know, Saudi oil company. Yeah. Uh, that started out as a U.S. company. It, it actually started out just before World War II. And one of the reasons that the U.S. wanted to start their campaigning in Europe and in, in Africa was that this, I think they, they didn't call it the Saudi, uh, the Aramco then, it was the, gosh, like standard American Saudi oil, big long name. Started by Standard Oil, Texaco, and one other company. Right. One of the reasons we went into, into Africa was because those guys had gone in a couple of years before into Saudi Arabia to develop oil so that if we went into Africa, we would have an oil supply. And, 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 and that was pretty critical at that time. Anyway, uh, three and a half years ago, they decided they wanted to go public, sell some shares. And their PR people in, in Riyadh put out the most amazing four slide set uh, for, to, 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 as a position paper uh, that was going to go out to the world. I worked with, at the time I was working with the Washington office of Aramco, because they still have a big presence in, in, in America. They do most of their hiring out of tech, their Texas office. They do most of their subcontracting there. The people in Washington took one look at this thing, which, and, and all it said is, we're the biggest, we're the best, uh, we'll stomp over everybody else because we have the most oil. So ignore everybody else, work with us. And, and, and the people in Washington in the Ramco office said, we, we can't let anyone in the, U, in the U.S. see this. We can't, because they work with Congress and senators and then state legislatures, particularly Texas and Louisiana, on energy policy, right? And they, they want seats at the table on the energy policy meeting. Yeah. Uh, and they said, well, you know, wh- what are we going to do? What are we going to do when this, when this gets out? Uh, and so we did a couple of little studies to, to see. And Aramco is telling the story about themselves with a goal of dominating the world oil market. And so they were listing as the antagonist, really, any other oil company that wants to challenge them they're listing themselves as the, as the climax character, the character with all the power who can make the story come out the way they want it to. Every time we test it on any kind of a legislature or business leader, they do this, this story flip that you're talking about and say, I don't care about Aramco. I, I care about you know, US policymakers. I, I care about myself as a US policymaker. And I care about, um, holding down the power of big foreign oil. And of course their motives then were to you know, protect American jobs, protect American environment, all that. So who's the, who then becomes the antagonist? Aramco. Right. All right, and any policy that's gonna stop Aramco suddenly becomes the hero, the climax character. Uh, and I said, all right, it, before you let this out, we gotta completely reframe the story so that you're providing a story using those elements to provide a story that will resonate with your target audience that is legislatures con- congressional staff uh, it, it, the fact is you want to say we have the most oil we can we can supply oil anywhere in the world we can stabilize oil markets no one else can say that that's what you want to say but you want to say it in a way that resonates with yeah. i said okay we got to change the main character tell me who is the character 
that your target audience cares about most? And they said, well, voters, because these are all elected officials. They care about voters. They said, okay, so we're going to tell a story about an individual. And I said, so what does an individual want? They don't care about a Ramco versus Standard Oil. They, what do they want? They want energy. Why? Every aspect of modern life is energy intensive. Communication, healthcare, uh, healthy food, place to live, uh, safety, all of it is energy intensive. So if you say that, I'm gonna tell you the story about a person, pick a person, and their need for energy, then all of a sudden, who becomes the antagonist? Anyone who restricts the flow of energy. Right. And then that put, let Aramco say, well, we can come in and help. So they really put themselves in that power position. Uh, it's the same story. We have the most oil, but it's told from a different viewpoint, changing the character, looking at what are, the, what are my options on who the character is, and telling the story that carries the message in a way so that their target audience would be receptive to it. Now, you know, th there's no one story that's going to make a Ramco, for big foreign oil company, uh, the hero of America, but at least it got them to be able to hold on to their seats at the table at a lot of those energy meetings. Yeah. It's just looking at who's my audience, what kind of a character can I use to make sense to them, yep. knowing the information, knowing the message I want to get across to them, then what are the character goal and the motives that I want to present so that my target audience will empathize with the story and start to receive and appreciate the message I want to get there. That's story science. That's, that's just so good. And to the degree as leaders that we can pay attention to that approach that you just said and these eight elements, uh, and trust that process as we develop it around purposeful telling. Um, I think it's a real edge for us, especially, again, in an age of disengagement, distraction, and distrust. You know, um, would you, let's close on that, Kendall. If yeah. you think about, you think about the leaders that are out there today, they're dealing with clients, they're dealing with uh, their, their, their employees. And, you know, everyone in a lot of ways, they were tired, right? We've been through at the filming oh, yeah. of this five months of persistent yeah. pandemic and, 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 and uncertainty yeah. in the market, you know? Yep. And so what would you, as we close this thing out, what's one thing that we haven't talked about that you would say to that leader to think about the use of story in closing the distance with their client, their team, their teammates, or, or even their, sure. their, their, their neighbor. Uh, and it is to think like the target audience. So if they're tired, if they're frustrated, if they're uncertain, if I was going to tell a story, I'd start, I, I, I first thing I do is acknowledge where my audience is. Mm. Start and say, you're tired, aren't you? You're fed up with people standing up here saying, here's the new plan. And, you know, the, and then suddenly coronavirus strikes in, in our community uh, and it all gets thrown out the window. Aren't you frustrated by that? Meet the audience where they are. Acknowledge them. And then, then once you've got that, you've got to say, all right, here's here's where I want to go. Here's where, here's, here's the story I'm going to put out and know that you've got to put out a goal. What concrete physical thing do you want to, do you, are you, do you want to promote? Are you saying, what are you after? And push the motives. Why, why you, why it's important to you and why it's relevant to them and why they should listen why they should be engaged by this story. Once you've done that, um, then at least you're in the door. You have their, you have engaged them, you have their attention, and they're ready to listen to then the rest of those elements as you develop them. Yeah. But that's where I would, that's where I would always want to start. 
And I think that's what we need to be doing, everybody, as we as we lead through this. As you think about the the, the connection gaps that we face, that triple D churn, those those gaps between where we are and where we want to be. Um, Kendall just gave us some great advice to think about, regardless of what group we're in, regardless of what what party we stand in. Like that. So if what if what if everyone in the nation thought about their engagements the way he just described? What would the world look? What would our country look like? And as a, as a guy who, who fought a couple of deployments and, and has three boys going into this world now, you know, what Kendall just described is, is a way that we can hand it off to our kids better than we found it. Um, Kendall, any closing thoughts or anything on your end? Every human being is an expert storyteller. You've spent your life from the time you were probably less than two working on your storytelling ability because it's how you got what you wanted when you were a kid. The problem is you don't hold that information in your conscious mind. Why? Conscious mind is the slowest processor in your brain. You have a number of other processors that are 100,000 times faster where you keep all the stuff that you do repetitively, like heartbeat, like running your body. Uh, yeah, but also a lot of information, like how to you tie your shoelaces. You don't consciously know what you do with each thumb and finger when you tie your shoelaces. You just do it. Tell your stories the same way. Becoming an effective, a truly effective storyteller isn't about learning anything new. Those eight elements, they shouldn't really shock anyone. No one should look at that and go, I don't know what he's talking about. I never heard of that. <laughs> but because, but we don't consciously think about them when we're developing our story material. It's becoming, it's taking this whole process that you've trusted uh, as a subconscious process and, ju and just if it, when it works, it works, when it doesn't, it doesn't, and making it a conscious process that will consistently deliver. Uh, and that's a lot easier than going back to school and learning rocket science, and unless you already know rocket science. Uh, but it, this is a natural process and everyone already has the the internal skills they need the question is to make it all conscious so you can plan it last thing is when we think of the word story don't think of a thing story is really the result of a long series of very conscious decisions and choices over a number of discrete material elements, um, those eight elements, how you structure them, how you put it together. Every aspect of story is a variable that's at your total beck and call, wants to be your, uh, your obedient servant. Um, so don't think, well, I just got to tell the story and let it come out the way it comes out. No, it comes out the way you design it. And every little aspect of that story is, a, is an independent variable that you can control and vary to get across exactly the messaging you want to get across. Hmm. That'll do it. Well, yeah, that's just, that's, we're going to leave that. We're going to, you want to drop the mic? You want to drop the headphones? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, seriously, Kendall, as we close this thing out, I just want to say, um, honestly, the, the work that you've put in over the decades, um, I know you're just the kind of guy, you're humble and you, you know, you don't, you, you don't, you don't wave the banner, but I'm, I'm just no. telling you, you know, I've been around this game a while too on engagement and I've, it, what you've done is a game changer. It's changed, it's changed the game for uh, operators who have to go into rough places and, and, and law enforcement who need to connect communities. You've changed the game for business leaders who really need to connect to clients who are feeling scared and skeptical right now. Um, you, you've changed the game for veterans coming home with trauma and I've seen it firsthand and um, I've experienced it firsthand. And you know, what you have put into the world with your work is something that all of us can now take and, and, and really make it a better place with how we communicate our ideas. So, you know, on behalf of everyone that is a storyteller, seriously, it's just, it's just groundbreaking stuff. Uh, I hope that we can stay connected because we unpacked Definitely. some stuff, but I think there's a lot more we could unpack, oh, yeah. maybe a segment for veterans at some point. Sure. 
Uh, sure. But I just think there's a lot to explore in this new world that we're in with your work. And, and, and I hope that we can stay hooked in together on that. Very good. And thank you so much. That, that touched my heart, what you just said. That was, that was incredibly moving. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Well, again, we're, we're very, very grateful. Uh, I'm going to get you a copy of the TED Talk. And for everybody Good. listening or watching this, uh, I can't thank you enough for being here. This is the kind of stuff that we need to be doing in the world right now. It's this kind of interpersonal skill set that makes us more relatable and more relevant to the people we serve. And that's what people need right now. We need leaders that step up and communicate and lead that way. Because uh, although fear is contagious, so is leadership. Thanks for what you do. And I'll see you on the rooftop.